Welcome to Stillwater's Church. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for being a part of our service today. Boy, isn't that a great song, Trusting in God. And when you trust God, you know he never fails. He never fails. And so that's good news. Well, I heard about a man that fell into a raging river, couldn't swim. And he cried out to the Lord, Lord, save me. And he even told the Lord, he said, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll stop cussing and drinking and smoking if you'll just save me. And all of a sudden, a big wave pushed him over toward the bank, and there was a root sticking out, and he grabbed a hold of the root. And he said, never mind, God, I've got it from here. So isn't that the way we act a lot of times with the church that, you know what, we want God's blessing in our life. We ask God to help us, but then when it comes time to to live in the way that he wants us to live, we're like, God, I got it from here. Well, today I want to talk to you about this subject, how to get the help you need. And that seems like a very broad subject. You got to narrow it down a little bit. I'm not talking about everything. Some of you are like, I need help with my plumbing at home. My toilet is running and I can't get it to stop. I'm not talking about that. And of course, some of you are like, You know, I need help. I need a new car. Mine is a piece of junk and it breaks down all the time. That's what I need. And some of you are like, well, I need a raise at work because my my, uh, paycheck is an embarrassment to paychecks and I need a raise at work. So I'm not talking about those kinds of things. What I'm talking about is spiritually speaking, but not just spiritually, relationally speaking, how do you get what you need? Now, the thing, the thing is, you can go into a marriage. How many are married? Raise your hand. All right? If you're married, listen, sometimes you don't get what you need. Now, Kim Miller, my wife, of be uh, 38 years this May. Um, yeah, I, w- I wasn't fishing for applause, but thank you anyway. So, uh, But my, my wife told me uh, one time, and I was, uh, you know, we were talking, and we were talking about the future and all this kind of stuff. And, and she says to me, she, I said, do I fulfill you? And she said, without hesitation, no. <laughs> I was a little taken back, to be honest with you. And, and here's what she said, and I thought it was brilliant. She said, I get my fulfillment from Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, here's the point. You got to get what you need. It's like the old song. Sometimes you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. And so we're talking about what you need. Now, the way that you get what you need is very simple. And what I'm going to be talking about today is preaching to the choir for some of you, okay? But hopefully it will show you from the Word of God how you can grow. Because in the study and the, prepare, the preparing of this message, even though I'm a pastor and I've been a pastor for a long time, God helped me to see what I need. And so hopefully you'll learn something uh, about that today, today. Well, God did not just design the church to help us center on him. Let me repeat that. God did not just design the church to help us center on him. Say, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to focus on Jesus when we come to church? Yes, you are. But that's not the only reason that he designed the church. He designed the church for us to focus on him, but also to focus on one another. Oh, you say, well, where do you get that? All throughout the New Testament. There are so many times the Bible talks about one another. And it talks about unity and fellowship and coming together. So God designed the church not just for you to come. And See, here's the reason that some people think they don't need church because they don't understand. They only understand half of the equation. They think that going to church is just about focusing on God and, well, I can listen to the radio or I can listen to Spotify or whatever place you listen to your music. I used to say tapes, and I know that's like 30 years out of date. And I used to say CDs, and that's more like 29 years out of date, all right? And so I don't really know, because I don't listen to music much. I listen to talk radio. That's what I listen to when I'm in the car. You're welcome. All right, so uh, some of you love music, though, and you're you're listening uh, to this, and 
you think, well, I can just listen to Christian music. Now, I hope you do listen to Christian music. Nothing wrong with it. It'll encourage you. I, many times I'll listen to a Christian song and I'm encouraged. Uh, or, and, and listen, often I listen to sermons myself. Even though I prepare and preach sermons, I listen to a lot of sermons. They help me. I get something from them. But listen, that's not the only reason God designed the church. And that's why some people, like I said, think that they don't need the church. I can listen to it online. I can uh, listen to it on the radio, and I'll get what I need. Well, God said we're to focus on him. True. But we're also to focus on one another. And there's a specific reason for that, because your spiritual life will not amount to much if you're disconnected from God's family. I know people sometimes don't think that's true, but I promise you, spiritually speaking, scripturally speaking, if you disconnect from the body of Christ, you're going to struggle with discouragement. You're going to get much more discouraged. You're going to struggle with apathy. I know many Christians that used to be on fire for the Lord, and because they got disconnected from church, you know what they're like today? They're very apathetic. They don't go. They don't give. They don't serve. They got disconnected, and eventually it made them stop really being focused on the Lord. Okay, This idea that you can focus on God without focusing on Christian brothers and sisters is not scriptural. And the reason it's not is because you won't stay connected if you don't have others in your life. So you'll struggle with discouragement. You'll uh, struggle with apathy and fear and sin. I can tell you this. I've seen people that used to be faithful. They used to be connected. And it's not about being perfect. It's not about having, I don't know how many of you used to go to churches that gave out those Sunday school pens. If you came off 52 Sundays, you get a pen. Uh, the church I grew up in, there's a man that had, it literally hang, it hang from his coat down below his waist. Okay? He, he was faithful. Okay? But that's not what we're talking about. All right? We're talking about being connected to the body of Christ. You'll struggle with sin, and you'll struggle with bitterness. That may be one of the biggest ones. Because what happens, and I've seen it happen time and time again, you stay disconnected too long, and before long, you're going to begin to scorn the people you're supposed to love. And, and it's easy to get scornful, right? Because somebody said something or did something, my goodness, I struggle with that kind of hurt every week. And I'm not a person that wears my emotions on my sleeve. My response is typically to get angry. And, you know, you'll struggle with scorn. There are, and I'm in this group as well, many of us in our Christian lives, we have become scornful toward people of God and even toward men of God. Sometimes you hear a preacher that preaches something that you don't like or you don't agree with. Or, and, and so, look, there are some, no doubt, that talk about money too much. Or they have a pet peeve that they talk about too much. Uh, the church that I grew up in had all kinds of weird things that they talked about that they called sin. You could, and I grew up in North Carolina in tobacco country, okay? A lot of people in my church were tobacco farmers. I worked on a tobacco farm all my life. Almost everybody I knew smoked. So it was okay to stand on the front porch of that uh, church and smoke uh, between Sunday school and church. But by God, if you went to the skating rink, you were going to hell. I don't know where they came up with that, okay? Uh, bowling alleys and skating rinks. I guess the reason that they did, and the only reason I can figure that out, is because they played the devil's music. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and the devil's music was defined as anything that was not... Southern Gospel or Hillbilly Christian, all right? So, uh, you know, you could listen to that, but you couldn't listen to rock music because uh, that was the devil's music. And I can remember many, many times having uh, preachers come in and talk to the youth about burning their tapes. We used to have tapes back in that day. Burning their tapes, burning their records. And I was just always like, oh, my goodness, what a waste of money, <laughs> you know? And so we would have preachers to come in and they would, to try to 
convince people that you shouldn't listen to that style of music. We, we had these preachers that would come in and they would play some of the songs to illustrate what you were not supposed to listen to. And the only thing I enjoyed about those services was the songs that they played. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Don't miss it. We can become scornful and bitter and angry very easily as Christians. We look at the world around us and we think, well, it should be better. These people shouldn't have said that. These people should do this. You know what I've discovered is that lost people, people that don't know Jesus, don't have quite the same expectations of everybody. They know that everybody's going to fail. They know that people are going to disappoint them. And what happens when you isolate yourself, you begin to shrivel up spiritually. Now, here's what I know. If you were to cut off your fingers, not only would they stop growing, they'd stop living I know a little bit about that. When I was three years old, some of you that are new don't know this, and so I'm going to shock you. When I was three years old, on my grandpa's farm, he had big chicken houses, and there was a big fan. I don't know, it was probably at least this big around. And uh, I was playing, and I fell, and my hand got caught in the fan. Put your hand in the fan, and you will lose a finger. And I did, all right? So I have... Uh, a missing digit, okay? Now, the reason I would share this story with you is just to make this illustration. My dad, I was just a kid, and it was a little finger, you know. My dad took that finger that had been cut off, and he put it in something, I don't know, formaldehyde or something, and put it in a jar and kept it. I do not know why he did that, but I can tell you this, that finger never lived again. It had been cut off from my body, and as a result, it began to die. And the same is true in Christian living. You know how to get what you need. you got to be around others. Here's what I say. The church should be the first place people run to when they fail, when they sin, when they do something wrong, when they disappoint. But often the church is the last place that people want to go. They feel like they're going to be judged. They feel like that somebody's going to get on to them. But I want you to understand that the church is to be a hospital for the sick. It's not to be a country club for the insiders. The church is to be a place where true fellowship happens. Now, true fellowship is not just eating in the cafe on the way in. Now, don't our people do a great job with all that stuff? We can give them a hand for that. It's great. In this church, hopefully I feed you spiritually, but even if if I fail on that part, you're going to get some food when you come here. If you leave hungry, then that's your fault, all right? But I want you to understand that the church should be the first place that people turn to, but yet because we are afraid because we don't know what the Bible says, when we have a problem, we isolate. And that's not God's plan. It's easy to isolate when you have a loss of a loved one. It's easy to isolate when you lose a job or a marriage or a kid. It's easy to isolate. And it's easy to isolate when you get hurt or when somebody offends you. Very easy to isolate when you sin and do something that you're afraid somebody's going to judge you for. But did you know that biblically speaking, that when that happens, the church is the first place you should go. Now, it's incumbent upon us who members of the church to understand the grace of God and to understand what our role is in fellowship, the Greek word koinonia. And it means to come alongside of. And Fellowship is more than just eating chips and dip and watching football. Fellowship is more than just going to a barbecue. Fellowship is literally coming alongside of someone, the brother and sister in Christ, no matter what. That's why we use this statement here. We embrace the mess. And can I just tell you this? You're a mess. 
Now, you may not think you are. You may look like less of a mess than some do, but you got a messy life. You know how I know that? Because you're human and because you are a sinner. Now, you may put on the Sunday face and come to church and everybody thinks that. You ever met somebody that went to church and they had that Sunday face, they looked perfect, and you thought, man, if I could just have their life, and then you find out something later that their marriage blows up, their life blows up, and you thought, man, I thought they were Ken and Barbie. What in the world happened? Right? And the point is this. You can get the help you need, no matter what, no matter how you failed, but you can't get it alone. Let that sink in. Biblically speaking, and I'm not speaking the truth of Richie, I'm speaking the truth of the Word of God. You can't get it alone. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 40 to 47. This was right after the church started, and there were 3,000 people that got saved on that first sermon. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, isn't it? The first sermon that was preached in that church, 3,000 were saved and baptized. That's amazing. So it says, so those who received his word, Peter was the one preaching, and he's talking about the word of God. Those that received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I'm going to break this down for you. And awe came upon every soul. When's the last time you were in awe of God? You were in awe in his presence. You were in awe of what he did. Great awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. A great move of God. Normally, great worship leads to great prayer and great pursuit of God. And when that happens, a great work of God happens. Because when the Holy Spirit begins to work, you see, I can work, and it, the result is that I work. When God works, things change. So he said, and they were all who believed together were all who believe were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Man, what kind of generosity was that? And day by day. Now, we only have church on Sunday. Uh, day by day. Now, they didn't just go to the temple. They also went to homes. It says, and, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes... They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. Wouldn't it be great to be a 365-day-a-year church where people are coming? Well, there's great emphasis in this passage on togetherness. There is no scenario in Scripture that suggests that not gathering with other believers or dropping out of church or going it alone in Christianity is a good idea. In fact, that was inconceivable in the New Testament. I mean, they didn't even think to talk about that. They wouldn't think, hey, you know, we got to talk to old so-and-so down here. Uh, He's trying to do church without the church. He's trying to have his relationship with God, and he's not a part of the church. That, That would never even have dawned on them. They would never have thought of that. They were so together. Together. One of our sayings is, we are better together. Why is that? Well, I've already told you several of those reasons, but we're getting better together because God works when we're together. Now, you've heard without doubt that the Bible talks about when a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, when they put their faith in Christ alone, by faith alone for salvation. When they do that, the Bible says they get born again. That's a spiritual birth, spiritual renewal. And I'm going to use some words that some of you probably are not that familiar with, but you get, you become justified. And that means that God makes you right with the father in his sight. And when he looks at you, the reason you can go to heaven, when you pray to ask God to save you, when you pray to ask Jesus into your life, the only way you can possibly go to heaven 
is that God justifies you. What does that mean? He gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he takes your sin upon himself. And so when God looks at you after you've been justified, he sees, oh, he looks like my son. Oh, she looks like my son. Oh, that one looks like my son. And so it is through that that you become a follower of Jesus Christ. But here's what the Bible also says. That when you do that, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. In other words, he takes up residency in your life. He is with you. Now, do every, does every Christian act like the Holy Spirit lives in them? I don't think so. Sometimes we forget, but he's there and he's available. So the Bible teaches that. But did you know that the Bible also teaches that not only is the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, but that the Holy Spirit indwells the church? That's why I believe that Live worship is better than listening to it online or listening to... A, there's just something about it. You know what makes the difference? The Holy Spirit. There's something about hearing the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God together. Now, can you listen to my sermons online? Yes, and if you miss it, I hope you do listen. But there's something about the power of the Spirit of God in the gathering. And did you know that before the church even started, Jesus established that? He said, where two or three are gathered together, that's that gathering, that's the ecclesia, that's the church. He said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. So the indwelling Holy Spirit of God is what makes the difference. Now, I want to tell you, you get the help that you need through togetherness. Now, from this... Buckle your seatbelt. I've got 10 statements to make. Now you're like, oh my goodness, you can barely get through three points in, uh, in time. How are you going to get through 10? They're not very long, but they're very, very powerful. You'll have them on your uh, app, your Bible app. You can follow along, read it during the week. Uh, you can have it on the Church Center app. It's on there. You can have it in your small group notes, or if you don't have that, write it down. Write it down. It'll be a help to you. How do you get the help that you need? What are the benefits of being together? So, so get the main point is that we're better together. When we come together, God uses us more. God helps you be encouraged. He spurs you on. So we're better together. What are the benefits of what happened in Acts chapter 2. Number one, confidence in your salvation. Those who received his word were baptized. Let me ask you a question. You ever doubted your salvation? You ever wondered? Has the devil ever perched on your shoulder and whispered into your ear, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have said that. You must be a horrible person. You can tell the devil to go to hell. No, I'm serious. You say, well, <gasps> did you cuss in church? No, I, I just spoke what the Bible is very clear, that he eventually is going, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says that in the end, before God cast him in the lake of fire, people are going to look at him and they're going to scratch their head and they're going to say, is this the one that deceived us? Is this the one? That's the point. He only has, make. he's very powerful and even, uh, the angels don't rebuke him by themselves. They use the power of the word of God. But you and I can too. The Bible says that we can resist the devil. We can flee from him. And so you can have confidence in your salvation when you're together. Uh, number two, you get stickiness. Stickiness. And I don't mean like uh, eating a donut and getting that on your fingers. But the word actually devote, when it says they devoted uh, to each other and to the apostles' teaching, did you know that word in the Greek language means to stick? You stick together. You, you get sticky. And boy, do we need some stickiness today. People need to stick with what God's doing. People need to stick with their marriage. They need to stick with the church. You get stickiness. That's a benefit. 
because there's going to come a day soon and probably often that you need to be stuck together with other believers. You're going to lose a loved one. You're going to have a funeral. You're going to get sick. I mean, we could just go down the list, but you need stickiness. Uh, the third benefit is you get a better understanding of the Bible. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can't learn by listening online. But notice what it said. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Now, why is that important? Because they listened to the word of God together. Did you know in, in this culture, they were more of an oral culture and they could probably retain more than we do because we've got so many things bombarding our brain. We can't remember as many things as long as that culture could. But think about this. Um, when you're listening to a sermon, do your experts say that you'll probably get about 10%? You'll probably remember about 10% of what I say. And I'll say this. If you remember 10% of what I say, I think I'm knocking a home run, all right? Because a lot of you, and listen, <laughs> this is the truth. A lot of you will tell me, Pastor, that was a great message today. And you better be glad I don't ask you what I preached about because you couldn't tell me. <laughs> and don't, don't be offended by that because somebody asked me last week about what I preached the week before. And I couldn't remember what I preached. <laughs> and I'm the one that did it. But think about this. If I get 10% and you get 10%, and you get 10%, and another gets 10%. Well, that's four people that make up a small group. And rather than just getting a little bit, they can talk about it, and you'll probably get a lot more out of it. So a better understanding of the Bible. Number four, unity. The word together means to be of one mind or to be in one accord. It's unity, not uniformity. It doesn't mean you have to like everything the same, be the same fan of a football team or a baseball team or like the same colors. It doesn't mean that. You don't have to have the same favorite food, though I do believe that there is a gospel bird and it's called Chick-fil-A. All right. So I'm just saying that's Christian chicken. All right. But there's no, uh, there's no uniformity in what God is saying. And if you don't believe that, look around you. Look at the people around you. Different races, different heights, different sizes. We won't go into that. Different looks. Some of you have, some of you women have natural colored hair. It says it right on the bottle that you use to color your hair. It's natural. <laughs> and then some of you men have hair and some of you don't, you know. I heard one guy say, my dad, he shaves his head. Uh, my dad said that uh, God only made so many perfect heads, the rest he put hair on. <laughs> Maybe that's true, I don't know. But he's not talking about uniformity, he's talking about unity. And let me tell you what that implies. It implies participation. Unity is participation. Now think of it in terms of a football team. What if your starting quarterback decided that he was not going to come into the game, he was going to sit on the bench, and he was going to drink, uh, eat some hot dogs and, and drink some ice-cold soda, and he wasn't going into the game. He wasn't going to participate. Would he be a part of that team for very long? No. Why? Because he's not participating. Now, and you've heard me say this, there are many, many Christians and many churches First church I was senior pastor of, we had 3,342 members. I was 31 years old. You say, well, that was a mega church. Not only about 200 came every Sunday, all right? So now I often said the FBI couldn't find most of the people who were members of our church. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us a lot of people signed a piece of paper, but not a lot of people participated. And you know what the Bible clearly defines that you being a member of the body? It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible you need to sign up to join the church. But you know what it does tell us to do? Participate. Join in. You say, well, I don't know what to do. Well, start hanging out with us and we'll show you. You'll discover it. 
Now, I used to give all these spiritual gifts tests, but you know, I figured out one day they didn't have that in the New Testament. And those people figured out pretty quickly through the power of the Spirit of God what they were good at, what they wanted to do. Uh, recently, I was going through the book of Exodus, and you know, God, when they were building the tabernacle, there was a man who led the children of Israel to build the tabernacle and all the stuff. And the Bible says that God put his spirit in him to do that work. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Maybe you're a craftsman. Work with the spirit of God. You don't have to be a preacher, okay? But unity and being together. Uh, another benefit, life-altering worship. That word awe means to fear God. It is worship with deep, deep reverence and respect. It is when you come into the presence of God that you recognize his sovereignty and his authority. Listen to Psalm 112, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. Now, would you like to leave a legacy? Would you like your family to follow the Lord? He says this is the way you do it. And the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Now, I do believe that God blesses you financially when you follow him, but this is not really what he's talking about. Just because you go to church doesn't mean that God's going to give you a brand new Mercedes. Now, I wish it did, all right? I've been driving the same car for 16 years, okay? You say, well, can you not have ever gotten another car? Absolutely. But uh, you know what I like better than having a new car? No car payment. I love that. Now, every time I get in a car and I want to smell that new car smell, because to be honest, I hold my dogs around in mine and I eat in it and it doesn't always smell that good. But I'll go, ah, it smells like money to me, all right? But it doesn't mean that he's going to give you a brand new car. What it means is that he is going to bless you. Do you know that there are some things that are worth more than others? And your peace, your family, your relationship with God, your joy. What good does it do to have all the wealth in the world and no joy, no happiness? Now, I don't know this personally, but I do know that there are some that I read about that they become wealthy. In fact, I do know some of it personally. I, I remember standing in the driveway of, of one of my neighbors years ago, and he and his wife, they were killing it, killing it. They were making more money than anybody that I knew. They were making it by the truckloads. I, I'm talking about real money. I'm not talking about... They were making a lot of money compared to others. They were making a ton of money. And I'll never forget standing in his driveway. And we were talking. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, I'm making more money than 99.9% .9 of people in the world ever make. And he said, I'm the most miserable human being on the planet. You see, just because you got lots of stuff doesn't make you happy. Now, I'd like to give it a try in case anybody's wanting to give some stuff away. <laughs> I'll test that theory. But God says that he will bless us, life-altering worship. Let, let me wrap this up. They became generous. That's one of the benefits of doing this. You'll become more generous. We say generous people are happy people. And I can tell you this. I'm happier by being generous than I am by being greedy. So are you. It's in you to be generous. Uh, they experience miraculous provision. We read there that they even experienced God's blessings on their food. They received it with gladness and joy. Now, let me ask you a question. And I'm not talking about do you have ulcers or do you have indigestion or you have to take Prilosec. But do you have a life that is so filled with peace that you literally can enjoy your food? Not only do they enjoy their food, they ate meals together, together. And, and part of that was the Lord's Supper. It wasn't just that they came together and uh, Joe brought barbecue 
it had to have been barbecue beef because they were Jewish. And so, um, you know, or barbecue chicken because they wouldn't have had pulled pork. But maybe, maybe uh, you haven't enjoyed your meal in a long time. God says he'll give you that favor, that favor. Uh, you get a spirit of thankfulness. I met a man one time, and he was not wealthy by anyone's standards. Had a little tiny house. He and his wife had lived there f- for many, many years. He had eight children. Eight children. And I'm not talking about this was like from 1912, okay? This was, this was when I was a youth pastor in the 90s in, in Florida. And I'll never forget, this guy looked at me, and he said, Richie, I'm the richest man that you'll ever meet in your life. I just kind of snickered, you know. I'm like, what? Because I could see his house. I could see his car. He said, you know what the definition of wealth is? That there's nothing that you want that you don't have. He said, I've got everything I want. You know, that, that is a blessing from God. A lot of people don't ever get there. The contentment. Then you get favor. He said they had favor with all the people. You and I, you know what we need? We need God's favor on our life. And then finally, they experience a great move of God. The amazement of this early church. They saw a great move of God and it changed them forever. In fact, it changed the world. I've got several verses I want to read. I don't know if I've got time or not. I'll read a couple of them. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's what coming together in church does. It motivates you. You express love more. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. You need encouragement. So do I. And it says even so much more as you see the day of his return drawing near. You know what that means? You ain't got but so much time. Now, I'm 59 years old. On September the 20th will be my 60th birthday. And it is becoming abundantly clear to me that life is passing me by at warp speed. The older I get, I used to hear my grandparents and my parents say this, the older I get, the faster it goes. I promise you it seems that way. Because just yesterday, I was still in my 40s. I'm not kidding. I mean, I I look at myself and I'm like, well, I I look like I've lived for over a decade. But I don't feel like it. But, you know, we need to take seriously what God says. He said, be much more diligent as the day of Jesus' coming draws near. You say, what if Jesus doesn't come while I'm still alive? Well, you still have an appointment with God that's drawing near. I don't know how long you're going to live. Um, I, I've had some relatives that lived 100 years. My wife asked me, do you want to live 100 years? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> not like this. If it keeps getting worse, I'm like, God, let me get out of here, all right? So, but we do it because what God tells us. Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron. So a friend sharpens a friend. It's one of the reasons you need church. Keeps you sharp. It blesses you. It helps you. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's love. Love one another. You bear people's burdens. You help them. Romans 12, 5, we are all parts of his one body, and each of us has a different work to do. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. When I got married, it became clear to me that I no longer belong to myself. I belong to Kim. I'm glad. Now, there are... There's a clear delineation for husbands and wives. For husbands, you approach all your stuff as this is, uh, or 
she says to you, this is our stuff. What's yours is hers. And then when it comes to her stuff, she says, this is my stuff. All right, so <laughs> my wife has let me know over the years there are certain things I'm not to do, okay? And there's certain furniture I'm not to allow in the house, right? No matter how comfortable it is. He said, be devoted to each other like a loving family. James 5.16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Not only physical healing, but I believe emotional and spiritual healing as well. Some of you need that. And then he says, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, so speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so you'll be together in this. No one left out. No one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep on doing it. See, what's the message? Just keep on doing it. What are we to do as a church? Just keep on doing it. You say, what what am I to do if I fail? Just keep on encouraging one another. Just keep on coming around. Just keep belonging to each other. You say, well, what if I do something that's embarrassing? Join the club, okay? If we're all honest, if we're all honest, we all put on a bit of the Sunday face, don't we? We pretend, we act like that our stuff is all together. It's one of the things that amazes me about being a pastor. People come to me thinking that often I have no problems until they get to know me. I had a pastor friend say this to me recently. We were eating, our families eating together. And he said, oh, he said, I see you're real. I was like, okay, a compliment's coming. He goes, you got a lot of problems. <laughs> I said, well, thank you, I guess, you know. He, then he said this. He said, you're just like us. And you know what one of the most important things is about church is not that you put on airs, not that you pretend that you're perfect, not that you act like you've never messed up, but just be like everybody else. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't try or get forgiveness or change your life. It doesn't mean you keep on doing the same thing over and over again that you know is wrong. Definition of insanity is keeping on doing the same thing and expecting a different result. But you know what God wants us to do? The more we hang out, the more we're together, the more real it gets. And you know what's true about my family? The longer I hang out with them, the more I spend time with them, the less of this barrier I have. My wife, my children, they know me better than you do. And this way it should be. When it comes to the family of God, don't act like you don't have problems. I can tell you this, my wife, she is probably one of the best I've ever seen at helping people, connecting with people that I call them the misfit toys. People that have problems, people that have failed, people, I can tell you this, my wife has connected with people so diverse, I'm not even going to go into it, but so many different ways. And you know what she's doing? She's doing what the Bible says, we're better together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all to be together, to follow you. I thank you for everyone here. God, I pray now for those that need to be saved today. Maybe there's someone that says, you know what? I need to follow Christ. I need to become a believer. If you're watching online or if you're in the room, pray this prayer and understand that God is sovereign. God is the one that guarantees salvation. He's the one that gives the faith. He's the one that saves, but he responds to our faith. And so here's what he says. Trust him. Come to him. Believe in it. So pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believe that you did everything necessary. Your work is finished. You did everything necessary to save me. So right now, I'm asking you to save me, to forgive me, to make me new, to let me be a part of your family. And if you pray that prayer in the room, please Fill out the next step card and drop it in the 
little thing on the way out. If you're online, click at the bottom of your screen so that you can let us know.